Welcome to Sandoval Video Box. This live stream of the September 2021 Sandoval Board of Directors meeting, broadcasting from the newly built Sandoval Clubhouse, is simulcast on the official communications Facebook page, Sandoval Cape Coral, and on the Sandoval Neighbors Synergy Group page. Viewing of this meeting is available at your convenience 24-7, on the YouTube channel, Sandoval Video Box, and Sandoval's website, www.livesandoval.com. If you haven't already, consider subscribing to support Sandoval Video Box on YouTube by clicking both the subscribe button and bell to be notified of future meetings and presentations. The meeting will begin shortly. If you, the viewers, have any comments or recommendations you would like to see in future live streams, email your comments to sandovalvideobox at gmail.com. Sandoval Video Box thanks you for your support by subscribing and your participation by watching this meeting. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the September 30th Sandoval Community Station board meeting that I'll call to order at 6.04 p.m. If we would uh, uh, please rise for the pledge to the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Roll call, President Cootie, present. Vice President Bernard. Secretary Sam Fredito. Present. Director Conway. Present. Director Palmer. Present. Director Spooner. Present. Director Stout. Uh, here, present. And, and representing FSR tonight is uh, Mr. Harshman, Steve Harshman. We have the establishment of a quorum and proof of service. You did go out, correct, Steve? Yes. Okay. Okay. Were there resident comments on agenda topics? On agenda topics? No. All open forum. Okay. We've had the uh, past minutes presented to us. Um, I'll call for approval or any changes. I'll motion to approve. Motion to approve by Marilyn. Second. Second by Lori. Discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Um, my, uh, uh, I'm actually suspending my uh, president's report tonight. We have a pretty full boat uh, agenda to, to cover, so I want to move this along as um, quickly as possible. I, uh, two things I do want to mention is uh, tomorrow, as most of you know, um, is our uh, grand opening celebration for this building. And um, uh, Lorraine and the social committee uh, uh, Lori and Anita put a lot of effort, a lot of volunteers, uh, a lot of things going tomorrow night, music, food, uh, games for the children. And so we'd love to see a good turnout. There's going to be a ribbon cutting ceremony at, at six o'clock. So I would uh, in, encourage you all to attend. And then um, when we get to the open quorum questions, um, a couple things that have happened the last couple of meetings that are getting away from us is, um, interruptions from the audience. Uh, if, if you're not on the agenda to speak, you won't be recognized to speak from the audience. Uh, so we ask you to make sure you get up and, 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 and put your name on the list. And secondly, we will be enforcing the three minutes. After three minutes, um, we'll move on to the next. In fairness to everybody who wants to get their time in. Move to the board treasurer's report. Mr. Tubb. The August 31st, 2021 financial highlights. The Finance Committee did meet in September twice. Financial statements were delivered on time on September 20th, 2021, and the committee met on September 21st and again on the 28th. The mistake made by, made by FSR in both June and July was corrected after your treasurer pointed it out to them. GL account number 70287. I can hear it. 
uh, the GL account number seven two where I go seven zero two eight seven in Vera expense was dropped from the June and July financial statements, causing those monthly income statements to report net income more than eighty thousand dollars over actual. Our August thirty one income statement now includes in Vera expense and shows a positive income for the month of one hundred thousand dollars and year to date of three hundred and sixty four thousand. Keep in mind, 115000 of that comes from the contingency expense, which has only incurred $10,000 against a budget of 125000 Also, another large portion of this comes from assessments for items such as mulching, $70,000, which will not be spent until the last quarter of the year. So we're in good shape, but don't get excited. The Finance Committee transmitted its concern in June with, res with residential delinquencies. As of August 31st, we've, we have made considerable progress in redu reducing these. On July 31st, total delinquencies over 30 days were $194,730. On August 31st, that number was reduced to $125,761, a reduction in delinquent accounts of $68,968. I would remind you also in the month of September, we spent $4,200 reimbursing First service for 122 delinquent letters. So when people come to you saying, please waive the fees, and the, we have expenses involved in that collection, so I would discourage you from waiving fees in the future. Uh, the primary reason for the Finance Committee to have met twice this month was to build a recommendation for the 2022 budget for this board. That has been done, and while there is no provision in, on your agenda for it to be presented to the board tonight, John Elkins, the chairman of the committee, is here and prepared uh, to present it to you if you wish. Otherwise, we'll give you paper copies you can study before your October meeting. What are the board's wishes on that? John, we'll do a brief overview after you. Okay. Report. So are you ready after me? Okay. Two more, two more points I've got. As of August 31st, 31st, accounts number RSV1, RSV4, and RSV5, our, our reserves, contain $1,671,472. Accounts number RSV3 and RSV6, the bulk telecom fund, contains $1,033,479. And OPR1, OPR2, and OPR3, the operating accounts, contain $835,100. One final item. As this new clubhouse building has been given a CO for occupancy, the builder's risk insurance no longer covers it. We've been in touch with Ian Keith at Keith Insurance about binding coverage. Two questions need to be answered. First, we have $300,000 in business personal property coverage in both buildings. Does that need to be increased? We have not been advised by anybody what the values in here are. I, I assume the board would have a better idea than. Would you would you direct us to increase that or leave it at three hundred thousand? I would ask for an advisory opinion from the risk assessment. They're from insurance. From whom? The committee. What's that? The insurance committee. Well, I, I it was my understanding the insurance committee was a subset of the risk committee, risk assessment. So, so you want to delay getting insurance until we get it? No, I, I would like an, a discussion, and we can do that immediately. I mean, afterwards, we can meet in the morning, but I'm not going to give you an off-the-cuff off the answer. Okay. Uh, the, pr the preliminary bid that he put in to get the, the coverage has $100,000 additional to it. Uh, secondly, do you wish to add flood insurance coverage to this and the old building? I'm looking to the board for direction. Same response. I think I'm hearing as we should, but I'd like to get that recommendation also from the insurance committee. So we'll put on abeyance until you hear from them and you give us a... No, I think we need to make an immediate um, decision. Obviously, we can't do anything right now. It's after 6 o'clock, but this should be addressed first thing in the morning and brought to each board member to approve any advisory opinion on those two simple questions. But it needs to be done expeditiously. So I would say... So I'll wait till I hear from the board to proceed with Ian. Well, I think we need to make sure that nobody's waiting. I think we need to make this, I would set a deadline of 10 a.m. tomorrow to ask for a decision. Okay, so noon tomorrow? Make it 11. 11 o'clock tomorrow. If I hear nothing, we'll do nothing, correct? 
No, um, you will hear something. So assumptions aside, we will have a, the board will communicate with you. Okay. That concludes my presentation. So here is. I've uh, got a quick question for you. Okay. When is the next reserve study? It will be next year. It's every three years. It was done in 2019. So 2022 will be the next one. Have we made, um, or do we plan to make any adjustments to the new building to make sure that we're not having to play catch up? The, before the reserve study is done, yes. we have made, we're still collecting $3,000 per unit in resales. That's all. We haven't made any changes to that. So, if the board would like to direct, we can. Well, I think the reserve study is going to be a bit understated because it's not going to account for the new building. Oh, no, it will because the engineers will come on site and see what we have, so they'll see the new building. Okay, as long as it's accounted for. Yeah, they, they, they come on site, do an inventory of everything, and that's where they build the reserve study from. So when they come on site, they'll say, oh, golly, there's a new building here. We need to include that. I don't know when it will be scheduled. That will be up to the management company to schedule that. Okay. Any other questions? Questions? Thank you, Bill. Okay. What was yours? Okay. To test the process, I can project the budget on that screen in great big numbers, but I don't think you want to work on that tonight when I'm ready for it. <laughs> no. It's a... Uh, so we're not going to go through the whole budget. I will say that there are a couple items that we want to talk about. One, the budget looks to be uh, pretty solid for next year. I think you'll like it. There's some areas of concern. One is insurance. It's not just the fact we don't have insurance yet, but insurance rates, commercial insurance rates are rising rapidly, maybe 20, predicted 25% in the next year. In addition to that, we feel we're, we're tasked not only in investments, but everything else to actually minimize risk to Sandoval. And therefore, we, we think it's to our advantage to get flood insurance. All right. So the numbers that we projected are for insurance uh, for property is $29,000 for, uh, for next year, which is a significant increase over this year. All right. Uh, further, we think that there is a um, maintenance expense will go up, particularly for maintenance of our gates. We'll talk about some of the things later. But uh, the other question you asked me was to recommend what we do about the um, people who paid annually, what we do about their rebate. We really, we really suggest that you just give them a credit. They, they paid in and made it for convenience, so give them a credit against next year, not pay anybody cash. Second, the committee would suggest that we have everybody pay quarterly. It makes the accounting easier. Clearly, if somebody gives me three grand, I'm not going to give it back. But, you know, yeah. So I, I really, unless you want to get into the budget, I don't have a whole lot more to say, except that we believe that the budget you'll see is pretty realistic and just two or three items that really need tweaking, right? Quick question on insurance. I believe the insurance on this building I saw quotes are about um, 13000 Is the insurance on this building included in our budget already? Is it anticipated? We put it in, we, we estimated what it would be. We don't know what it will be. So, in fact, the, the person on the committee that was probably best served to do that is Todd Reinhardt. He deals a lot with commercial insurance in his banking job. Okay. And he, he provided the numbers that we put into here, which is about $10,000 extra over this year. Has there been any discussion from more of a, a broader policy perspective on certain gel lines being increased or lowered, or are we purely going off last year? I, well, we're talking about for this building? No. No, we didn't, talk, we didn't talk about the liability insurance at all. Okay, no, what about things like uh, have you had any input from landscaping or any input no, from any board no, members no, no. or anybody in terms that we should tweak this gel line up or tweak it down? No. We, we really would suggest that we get the what? Ron, we, we have not had that. We went through it in some, some line items that we were aware of. We tweaked up or down. The rest of them came from Casey, and it looks like it's just a mathematical carrying forward from the annualized amounts from this year. Has any board members had any input? No. No? We think the Risk Management Committee should get involved in this pretty quick. Sure. Okay. Right. Well, we got a lot of work to do. Okay. 
Thank you. Any questions? When you're ready to talk about Gates, I got that too. All right. Thanks, Sean. Appreciate it. General Manager's report. Good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Steve Harshman, Vice President with First Service Residential. I'm giving this report on behalf of Casey, and she apologizes for not being able to be here. Uh, so uh, the water features will be turned back on tomorrow. The operators for the motors came in for the 5-horsepower motor faster than the 10-horsepower motor. The 10-horsepower motor is still on back order with the electrician, and the electrician will, will not hardwire the bypass in the panels as we hoped uh, as a temporary fix. The roof repairs were completed and the roof uh, pressure washing was done. Three paver estimates are in the works. I did see one of those today uh, for the, the rocky area over here by the basketball courts. The playground was also pressure cleaned. The pool area was pressure cleaned as well as the seats. Uh, more touch-up paint on items are being worked on. The action automatic proposal for the gate at Trafalgar was approved and is in the process of repairs. The pickleball nets are on back order per the sports company that we hired for them for that. Management is also ordering temporary pickleball nets for the other courts, and those are on back order as well. The proposal to have pressure washing done in phase three was approved, and the work will start in the third week of October. As some of you know, the receptionist has been out on medical leave, and we have uh, Julian temporarily covering at the reception desk, uh, who is also ill this week as well, uh, but he'll be back in the office uh, shortly. I think he was here today for a, a short stint. Um, the social director attended a networking expo that I saw pictures of. It looks very nice. Uh, the new compliance coordinator attended classes to become CAM certified, and that's the Community Association Management Certificate. Uh, the pineapples for all street monument signs missing or damaged have been ordered and should be installed within the next week. The change orders for the paving project was approved and there was a delay in the deposit payment that uh, was resolved. Um, and then that we'll have a schedule next week uh, for that. Insurance for the expansion building was being worked on. Uh, general, the general manager met with the finance committee to go over proposed 22 budget. Uh, General Manager then revised a budget and sent it back to the Financial Committee after meeting and asked all, for all questions to be sent over to make it, uh, additional changes. There are many other projects that are in the works and proposals are being obtained for the gates, bocce ball courts, the basketball goals, and backboards. Management sent two proposals over to the board for cable to start the, in the clubhouse and gym for the movement room as well as the expansion building. And mulch proposal was sent over to the board for signature, and we hope to get that started uh, in October, on October 11th, uh, before Halloween. As many of you know, Sonia is the point of contact for Down to Earth Landscaping. Mike is no longer with that company. And that is the management report. You mentioned striping. Striping, yes, that, that'll be scheduled next week as well. Uh, the, the scheduling will be made next week. It's not going to happen next week. Any anticipation of when I say striping? That, uh, stop sign at a crosswalk. Hopefully, it allows you to stop early for the pedestrian. That is my understanding as well. Thank you. Any other questions for Steve? No. Appreciate it, Steve. Thank you. We'll move on to the um, ad hoc committee reports. Of house improvement um, continues. Is there anything to talk about the open house? Or? Well, we're here. Uh, I'm going to defer to uh, the social aspects to the rest of the committee. It's not really my area. Please. Um, social committee has been very busy in the last month readying the clubhouse for the grand opening and for the return of many activities. And the start dates will be announced by email when determined. Uh, rather than continuing saying the new, new clubhouse and the old clubhouse, we've named the buildings. This building is the Pelican building and the old administrative offices in the exercise room is a pineapple building. So when you see something being advertised for the Pelican building, you know it's this activity building, okay? Gary mentioned that the grand opening is scheduled for tomorrow from six to nine, and we're hoping that we see a lot of residents there. We have a fire truck coming for the kids, we have an obstacle course, a bounce house, 
to do music, food, drink, and uh, we hope you come and enjoy seeing the new clubhouse on the floor, and the mayor will be here to cut ribbon, hopefully make it happen. The social committee is planning uh, for the largest of the Sandoval events, which is Halloween. And on Saturday, October 30th, we're going to have both a haunted house for those who want a scary experience. And for those who are younger or less brave, we're going to have a non-scary pumpkin patch. I'm going to be a butterfly. <laughs> that one should be interesting. <laughs> both, that is scary. That wasn't nice. <laughs> both will be at the Pelican Building, and it will be from 6 o'clock to 9 o'clock. Halloween trick-or-treating will be on Sunday, October 31st from 5 o'clock to 9 o'clock. All guests will be uh, entering the community through the Veterans Pedestrian Gate. And because of the huge number of trick-or-treating treaters that are coming in that way, the Veterans Gate will be closed to all vehicular traffic on Halloween, starting at 4.30. This is for the safety of our trick-or-treating if you've ever been here for Halloween and you see the hundreds that come in, having cars come in at the same time is very dangerous. So we will ask the residents that they would please use the Pine Island, excuse me, and the Trafalgar Gates for entering and leaving the community. Wristbands for these events will be on sale at the Pineapple Building starting October 4th from 9 to 5 and from 5 to 7 on Wednesday, October 13th, 20th, and 27th. That should help the working parents to be able to come in and uh, get their wristbands. There will be a, a limit of 10 wristbands per home, and no residents need to have any um, wristbands. The price of these wristbands are $5, and payment can be made by check or credit card. And there is a $3 processing fee on the credit card. There will be no cash accepted. Um, and these will be sold at the Pineapple Building. And we're all looking forward to returning to many activities that we've enjoyed in the past and look forward to all the activities that are being planned by our social committee. We're going to close the gates at 4.30. We can anticipate a lot of people coming in before then. And there being a line, are we going to just, at 5 o'clock, say people have been waiting in line for a half hour to get into the community, are we going to tell them if you're not at this point in the line to just leave at the gates? Um, it could get a bit uncomfortable as the person having to tell the individual car that's been sitting for a half hour, sorry, you're not getting in now. I have to go back to another gate or go park. Because the proximity of 4.30 to 5 o'clock, perhaps maybe we should close the gates a bit earlier so we're not in that situation. Well, we, should, we did at 4.30, and the police actually went out and they metered off maybe like 18 cars and told us, and started to, you know, You know, we'll, well, the full complement of the we started at 4 30. Yes. The gates were closed at 4 30. And do we have the same amount of uh, police officers? Have we increased it? Decreased it? I think she followed through from last year to the year before. There, there will be police at the Trafalgar Gate and at, at the uh, Pine Island Building and patrols going around and then um, at the pedestrian gate monitoring the wristbands. And all parking will be at. I, for one, am willing to pay twice the admission to see you a butterfly. <laughs> so you can count on. Three times, I'll come I don't know if I'm ready for that. <laughs> Thank you. Um, just management, Kathy? Uh, nothing. The um, committee chair is still on, um, up north. It's back in October. Are we going to cover the fines under risk management? Pardon me? The fines? Uh, no, we're okay. going to do it under compliance. I'm going to do it at um, solicitation for additional agenda items at the very end. Okay. Table, Ron. Um. Um, just want to say update on CenturyLink. Um, as detailed in the last meeting, um, we did sign last month the addendum to the CenturyLink contract that provided an increase in speed. To 500 megabytes for $25 per month. We locked in that amount for the next five years so they cannot increase the cost. Um, we also got each residence 
one fire stick. Do you know if we've received those yet, Gary? Oh, we have. We expect that to be um, in the next couple weeks? Yeah, at least, yes, according okay. to Mark, yes. Um, last week, the service tech, um, the service techs fi finally finished the upgrade to our uh, CenturyLink internet system and uh, went online for most of us. Now, there's a few things that I would like to point out. This has been a bit of an education for me also to determine what speed I got. When I turned on my speed, I was about 325. Um, and so I wanted to know why. Um, the first thing they told me to do was to make sure it's not my device that's slowing down the speed. So a direct connection into the router to do a speed test um, was recommended. You also want to understand that there's two types of wireless, wireless service in your home. You've got a 2.4 gigahertz or the other one is a 5G. I never really understood what those two meant, but they mean two very, very different things. Interestingly, if you're on the 2.4, it maxes out at 159 megabytes. So you're never going to see 500, you're never going to see 200, you're never going to see 300, you're never going to see anything really above 159 megabytes. So why would you have that type, that offer? Because it's a much longer signal. It goes a lot further in your home. It's designed for appliances, handhelds. If you're listening to um, like Pandora or something further out in your yard, you want to make sure you're connected to the 2.4 gigahertz. But if you're streaming, you'd want the 5G because it's frankly faster. It can go all the way up to a gig, but you can't be farther, as far away from the source as you could be with the 2.4, so you're giving up distance. So when we're analyzing the speed, we want to make sure that we understand what, whether we're on the 2.4 or the 5 gigahertz, and, and every single home has those two options. So we want to make sure we're on the um, 5G if we're analyzing speed for streaming. We want to know the proximity, and we want to make sure that um, there aren't too many devices on there that are taxing the stream and therefore lowering your speed. So there is a bit of an education process for us as a community to understand what kind of speed we're getting and why we're not getting the maximum speed that we would all want. Um, I have had a flyer put together to explain the different types of wireless speed that I'm going to have uh, FSR send out to the community, but I think if we understand the, the way the wireless uh, CenturyLink is set up, it would help us understand what type of speed we're getting and what we should expect. Um, let's see what else. I, I also wanted to mention that if you're currently paying uh, for increased speed, they will not automatically cancel your account. You have to cancel your account because they'll keep collecting that money. So my recommendation was if you're paying for an increased speed, uh, cancel it, see if the 500 is sufficient for you, which it likely will be, and if it's not, you could still go up to a gig. But um, I'd be surprised if you needed to do that, frankly. Um, let's see. There will also be some, and they warned us about this, there are some older routers in the community that will need to be upgraded, uh, and there might be a service issue. So if you're not getting the speed you anticipate, we have provided a, um, a number directly to the CenturyLink techs, um, and they will uh, arrange to help troubleshoot this. It'll just save you time if you could do the first steps yourself in terms of making sure you're on the right network, you're, you're um, using um, 5G rather than 2.4, that type of stuff. But if you're having those problems, you'll certainly be able to contact the techs directly also, feel free to reach out to any board members, too, or if you see me, ask, you know, feel free to reach out to me. I'd be happy to answer any questions or get you in contact with the right people. Um, and that's really all that I have in terms of the CenturyLink update. I'll just to add, I, I think there was a reasonable, unreasonable expectation that Switch was going to be flipped and everybody was going to be the 500. And there can be, as Ron said, and my conversations, uh, Mark Elgato from CenturyLink, uh, multitude of reasons why the individual home isn't re receiving that. And I got a call the other day, said, well, why can't, why can't the office just 
make one phone call to CenturyLink and solve everybody's issue. Again, I wish it was that easy, but it's not, because every home is going to be different. So when you're having those problems, I'm certainly not getting any benefit being president because I'm still at about 40 and 20, uh, and no matter where I'm at in my house, so I've got to figure it out myself. Uh, but uh, I know it's there, uh, but we, we have to be patient. We have to work through the system, and, uh, and, and they'll get there, and they'll get to you, and, and hopefully get satisfied. There's a lot of people that are already getting 500. We're hearing from a lot of people that are, that are getting the max, so that's good. Um, so be patient. Um, contact them if you're not getting what you think you should get, and, and go from there. Okay. Thanks, Ron. Uh, Taylor Morrison. Taylor Morrison litigation. Uh, we had a committee meeting last week to discuss case status, um, continuing to develop phase three claims regarding um, analysis of uh, lake erosion. And we also uh, filed a motion to dismiss some of uh, Pope's claims, and that's pending right now. Um, and that's the update. Okay, we'll move on to the uh, Traffic Calming Committee's report. The famous Mr. Ed. Good evening, everyone. My name is Ed Coronado. That's good to see you all. And the way it works out is we form this Traffic Safety Committee that we we'll call a Calming Committee, okay? And uh, Linda Mooney is the chair, Val Zaleski, works with me and Gary Cuddy as our board liaison. Please allow me to tell you a little bit about my background in law enforcement and retired New York City police officer. And for the last nine years in the New York City Police Department, I was assigned to Brooklyn Highway Patrol, at which time I was trained and licensed to enforce the traffic regulations, <clears throat> qualified by DOT to enforce radar and speed limits. <clears throat> I investigated accidents. I was an investigator and uh, a licensed New York State driver's education instructor. My responsibility to provide safe travel for the presidential escorts, parades, marathons, and New Year's Eve celebrations was fun. Uh, but I got to tell you, I feel inadequate to, re to solve the problems that we have in our, our development, <laughs> even though we have less people here. <laughs> so the traffic survey was sent out. It was emailed to all the residents. <clears throat> we have 17 132 emails were sent. Some households received more because there's more emails on file. 66.6% uh, .6 opened the emails. 51.3% clicked to rate the survey. And the total completed surveys were 486. The ratings were based on a scale of 1 through 5. The following recommendations are based on an average rating be be being over 2.6, a majority, from the survey results. Once the committee received the survey results, comments were reviewed, all options and priced out options that were mentioned in the results. This evening, I would like to uh, present the survey results based on the average rating from highest to lowest and the estimated costs associated with the results. Okay, number one on the list would be rating 4.6. Trim the bushes at the monuments to ensure clear vision and view of traffic as you're approaching the crosswalks and intersections. Uh, the cost, the, H the HOA needs to address this with the Crawford landscaping to see if it was currently included in the landscaping costs. That's, what we, that's how we left off last, and that might have been rectified since. Install pedestrian yield signs. That would be number two, a rating of 3.5. Uh, the pedestrian yield signs that we're talking about would be placed in the center prior to the crosswalk. It would be about 42 inches high. It has a reflective sign on both sides. It has a swivel on the bottom. You can run it over at 60 miles an hour and pops back up again. I thought that was a really good sign. I think that's a worthwhile investment. It's $350 installed each crosswalk. We don't have to do all the crosswalks. We could do a few, see how it works out. I'm, I'm a firm believer in trying stuff. <laughs> conduct regular schedule. Number three was conduct regular schedule awareness emails regarding traffic codes of conduct. Rating was 3.2. And there's no cost for that. Emails can be completed by Traffic Common Committee or the Communications Committee. I, I, I think that holds a lot of weight personally. If you can get people to comply and do things because they want to, 
they feel that safety is an important feature in this community. I think that's imperative. We need to get that out there. And I really believe if you did one email a month, it, just to remind people, let me just say this from my experience. I stopped thousands of people, a couple of thousand speeding summonses a year. Most of the people I stopped had no idea how fast they were going. And if I asked them, did you look at your speedometer? They said, I was just following the traffic. I, so the truth is, we all have to be a little more cognizant of what we're doing when we're driving. And that way, take a look at your speedometer. If you're doing 35 miles an hour, you're going too fast. Okay, so that's why I thought that would be a good answer. Uh, number, um, number four, install solar, battery-powered, speed science, and license plate readers. This has been combined since one device can accomplish both tasks. So we have two types of devices. And the rating on this was 3.0 to 2.6, respectively, and the costs are like this. The signs that just show the speed limit as you're approaching, they flash their uh, LED signs, they light up at night, they're battery powered with solar generated power, they get mounted on a pole. Those signs are fairly, I thought they're fairly inexpensive. The problem with them is they don't take pictures, so there's no enforcement on that end. However, they do tell you how many cars have been going by and how fast they were going. It's, it gets stored in the memory. So that could be ascertained later on. That's a good idea, but those are $3,000 each. Then we have the uh, top of the line device, which shows the speed limit, and it takes a digital photo of the rear license plate of each vehicle as it passes by. And that's helpful because the way the software is set up, they could actually mail uh, summonses out to people from the HOA and um, tell them that they were going too fast. They would probably send a warning first. That would be the first line. And then the next time around, they might be getting a summons. So those signs run $12,000 each. It needs, I would recommend you need about six of them to really be effective. But again, cost being what it is, that's up to the board. <laughs> so install speed humps between Sandoval Parkway and the boulevard. And again, we, do, we could do some tests. And this was a rating of 2.9. The residents on this opinion were either strongly for or strongly against. Uh, the 10-foot speed hump can be installed on the stop line. You can run, run one across the entire roadway. Uh, there's a whole bunch of things we can do. I would like to do some testing first. Take a few spots, install a few, see how they work out, and see what the ramifications are. Because I don't see installing 30 speed bumps without first testing them as, as a good idea. So... That's what we came up with on that. And uh, in coordination with the gate committee, the humps would be installed at um, all three entrances. And um, estimated cost of those are, for the 10-foot speed hump, it's $320 to get it delivered here, and it's another $225 to have it installed. And a re committee recommendation to test this, like I said, on Sandoval Parkway or on the boulevard. Some additional suggestions, while not based on the opinions of the committee members, solely based on residents' comments from the survey results. One, why can't the Cape Coral Police Department address the sound of all traffic issues? Two, before installing humps, conduct a formal speech study. Conduct bicycle training for children and adults focusing on proper rules and cyclists should follow. Uh, increase speed to 30 miles per hour or decrease it to 15 miles per hour. Committee recommendation not to change the speed at this point. And that concludes my uh, report. Sure. Model with 3K, the sign that costs 3000 subsequently with the camera, or are they completely different? Because yeah. we can determine yeah. whether the 3K signs are working or not, and then if they're not, maybe add a camera. Yeah, well, we could start off with one of those, but to add a camera to that, no, you cannot do that. Okay. Yeah. You can have you, to totally get a totally different sign. Can you... Do these signs, the one with the camera and without, look similar? Yeah, the, the speed light, you know, the, the LED is similar, yes. Okay. It, do we have any potential to buy a bunch of 3K signs and one $12,000 sign that binds and put it in different locations? Yes. I met with Stacy Noto, who's in charge of the, uh, there's a Traffic Logics, that's the company, 
They're all over Florida. They do all the, the communities and developments. And she came out here, and we ran through the whole place. And so did one of the police officers from Cape Coral and I ran through, and we, we looked at everything. And she suggested that you could try a few, but the, the thing that they like to do is sell a package so you can give you a discount. You know, and, that's, and I understand that, but we can do that. We can have her come out here, and she could actually explain to the board exactly what would be done, how much it would cost, uh, zero in on everything, and then also show how it's done on the computer so you can bring up the link and look at everything that's good. You can see the cars that have gone by. And, and there's a statute, the Florida statute, that says that we have the option to do those, to enforce those laws. Excellent. Yeah. Thank you very You're much. You're welcome. Very, very well done. Thank you. Had I have a question? Please. Quickly. Um, so the $3,000 camera, is it worth... 3, 000, 3, 000. Or 3000 is it worth investing in maybe a couple of those just to do like a traffic, a 30-day traffic study to see where the high volume traffic is, one, and where the offenders are to help with the placement of possible cameras at a, at a later time? Yes, I think that would be a good idea. Particularly when you can get a record of the speeds. Yeah. We're going to get an average speed you know, if we're right. in an area where you know, it's hitting yeah. 35, 40 miles an hour, and we know we need to bring in yeah. the, the camera. From what I understand, I did some research. They are very effective. The ones that don't necessarily send summons and take pictures, the ones that just light up. Because like I said before, most of us don't realize how fast we're going. And that'll say, oh, I better look at my speed. I'm going too fast, you know. And I, I think that's good. on surf side. It's 45 on surf side. And, you know, typically it's flashing if you're running higher than right. 40. Thank you. Any, thank any you. other questions? We're good? Okay. Good job. Um, thank you, Ed. Thank you, Linda. Thank you, committee. You did a, a yeoman's work on this, uh, on this effort. And as we, the board realizes and the residents of this great community realize that um, uh, after gates, traffic is probably the biggest complaint we have. Uh, and we're just all concerned that we're just one accident away from something very tragic happening. Um, I get complaints every day from people, cars blowing through, uh, particularly when you, you're coming out of the Veterans Gate. Not too many cars stop at that stop sign right at Somerville. Um, it's, it's one of the worst ever and probably a place where we need to put a speed hump. As you all know, I'm an advocate of speed humps, and we're going to debate that tonight. Um, and uh, I may win, I may lose, but I'm going to – you're going to know where I stand. Um, I think that we at least need to, I think you're going to hear from um, from Rick and Vera that putting a couple speed bumps right before an exit gate, we, uh, we're pretty convinced based on other properties we visited, that's going to reduce gate strikes because we just have to slow down enough to give that gate time to react. And then and, and placing one or two at strategic stop signs such as the one at Somerville. Um, again, I'm not saying that we put speed bumps throughout the community. I don't think any, everybody wants that. But I think that uh, we need something to calm traffic down uh, in those areas. And beta testing, particularly, say, at uh, Trafalgar and at, at Somerville, try it. If, if it works great, we can move on to other areas. And if it, if it doesn't work, we don't have a tremendous amount of money invested in it, but um, I think that, uh, you know, I hear I might spill my coffee, I might hear you know, bump my rear end on my bike. Uh, I, I just, I think for what we're looking at compared to, you know, I, I drive, a, I have a Corvette and I drive it up Pine Island through those and I've never bottomed out, but I'm not going 40 miles an hour, I'm going 10. So if you observe the speed limits, you're, you're not going to hurt your your vehicle, so those, those complaints fall on deaf ears to me. But um, I would make a recommendation to the board that um, um, we look at a couple of these devices that committees uh, made recommendations on and um, making a purchase uh, and put them in strategic locations and do a 30, 60 day beta test and see how they're operating. I have a question. <clears throat> Are you talking? Speed bumps like um, on Surfside that goes into Beach, which are called rumbles, 
strips or no, are no. No. A hump is no. it's a speed hump. It's just it, it's, okay. It's, it's, it's not as high and as wide. I like the idea and of the portable. cameras. I like the idea of the cameras. Yes. Are we going to take this to a vote, or do we want to do a discussion now on the topic? Because I have a couple points I'd like to. Add. Yeah, make, I'd like to take it to a vote tonight. Yes. Okay. Uh, I, I would just say that. Sandoval has tried this before. We installed speed bumps six years ago. Didn't go over very well. Is the community going to be notified of what we want to have done and vote on it, or is this just mandatory? Um, no, I think this is going to this is going to be voted on, and you're you're going to get direction on which where we're going tonight. That's my understanding. This isn't just going to show up. We're going to vote as a board to take the recommendation of the advisory committee. Or to go in another direction. Is that my right, understanding? Exactly. And so we're basically. But I mean, it's not going to come before like we're going to get an email or something that there's going to be no. a vote on cameras, vote on speed bumps, nothing like that. Well, no, what you're going to do it with the, let's say right here, there's what, 40, 50 people. So we got a couple thousand people in here, maybe they don't want it. No, well, it's voted by the board. It's voted it's on by the board. The board. Yeah. Um, and we're not accepting comments from the floor right now, so. I would, I'm sorry, but that's we're moving along. Go ahead. Um, so, uh, in terms of what, what I was saying was that uh, we've tried this before, um, and they were taken out. I'm not a big fan of punishing, of punishing the 90 percent or 80 percent that don't speed, to to limit the 10 or 20 percent that do. Um, there are some. Uh, there has been some analysis done by some study groups. They are dangerous to motorcycles and bikes. They can damage the road. They're aesthetically. I know that's somewhat subjective, but consistently people say it's pretty aesthetically poor, and it does have an empirical decrease of property values. They also cost some money. Um, bad for cars. And um, again, I think there's. We've heard some really effective ways that can uh, limit <coughs> speeders. We even have a way to enforce, and I'd rather go in that direction. But that's my two cents. Uh, I could give you studies upon studies that are completely contrary to what you're what you're saying, Ron. And it's and I appreciate your opinion. Everybody has an opinion, and and most people have a very strong opinion, uh, one way or the other. And uh, you know, at the end of the day, we'll agree as a group here. On what we want to do, Lori? Well, I'm not a fan of speed bumps. I could see them being placed before the gates to try to lessen the, the chance of gate damage. Right. I would not like to see them every hundred feet on all of our roads. I could I could see them in strategic places, but I don't want to see. Yeah, I, I would not want point. to see them alter. No, I don't think the point is to have a hundred speed bumps throughout. It's strategic locations where we're, where there's issues, where issues are identified. And, and I think that the two, two that I named would be one at the Trafalgar, Trafalgar exit and one at the Somerville stop sign. That's where I think that that's where traffic really needs to get slowed down. Um, I'd be happy if we had made a test of two of them there, uh, if it's the board's pleasure. Uh, that would be my recommendation. Marilyn? I go over a speed hump at the old Edison FSW every Thursday morning. Um, I prefer the rumble strips. That gets your attention, but it doesn't cause the uh, same effect as the hump. But I don't know that they've been looked into. I, I do know they seem effective uh, for the, and the city uses them. But um, I don't know that I don't know that they were looked into.
speed bumps have to be attached into our roads, correct? So if we're, if, if we're going to beta test them, we're actually going to put holes in our roads. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If the cameras are going to tell us who's doing the wrong things, then we could go after them. I mean, I, so that's, yeah. That's not good. What my thought is, is like all of the recommendations that we had heard, this is all some really great options that we haven't tried before. We haven't done these. I'd love to be able to move forward with, you know, taking some of these recommendations and reevaluate before we go to the, the speed bumps. Um, and we know we have to address it. I would like to see if these other items that are less intrusive um, might be able to achieve the goal. Yeah. I understand the calibration of the um, systems, Ed, with the cameras, especially if we go to summonses or violations. Um, even though this is a um, pri these are private roads, it doesn't involve the police. It would be a, um, a Sandoval violation. But who would be responsible for calibrating them? Ourselves, or would this? They would come out periodically. Uh huh. Okay. All right, because I know that's been challenged elsewhere in other communities. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. So what do you suggest, Melanie? I'd like to go forward with the other suggestions, um, certainly looking more into the signs. Um, if they are pretty, if they're identical, it would be nice to be able to maybe buy one with the camera, and like Ron's suggestion, you sort of move them around, and you don't necessarily know if it's, if it's catching you, but it just draws your attention to it and um, start more awareness. And then I guess my other question is, is do we have any opportunity to, to rent those instead of purchasing them? Especially for a trial. Right. Ed, is there any option to rent? No. No rental. <clears throat> And also, we can suggest the locations and check the pool heights and the tree coverage, mm -hmm. whatever. Because so the really no parkway's all tree lined. Right. You know? right. I think it's some excellent options, and I'd really like to see that happen. I think it would protect our residents. I, and I mean, if even if we had set um, a time limit around it, say, let's evaluate for. Right, yeah, like two to three months or something like that. And then we'll come back and say, okay, so has it helped? Do we still need to consider the um, road street bump things? But um, I, I'm just, I just hate them. <laughs> I just, I, well, and I guess my other, but I guess that's my other question around the gate. Um, we Last time, last meeting, we agreed to open the gates. Have we seen any? Decrease in how much these bars are being hit, or anything with the gates being. There's no bar to hit. The the other one, the arm. Um, the arm. Um, right. Are hit. those still getting hit? Okay. No. So we don't really have a good good way of recognizing that. When we come up to Vera. Okay. 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 On the gate, you can only put them. I would like to have two up on Trafalgar, just on the exit. That is the number one hit gate. It's eight hundred and fifteen dollars and thirty nine cents when that gate up. When you got to replace that arm, it goes up and down. Just so you know, here's your bill. I'll be more than happy to show them to you. I need to shave. It's two point five seconds for that arm to come down. The Invera arms. Those, they're going to get caught up there. I've sat up there for months and watched everybody go through there 
Nobody stops. And when the freight train starts, if I put, I'm very limited of where I can put those because of the loop systems that are in the ground. Okay? They will be no bigger than what you go over, over at Publix, right off of uh, um, Santa Barbara. And I don't think any of you have ever bottomed out your car. And if you did, you had it coming. Because they're just not that big. I'm not talking about no six-inch things. These would be two, two inches. You know, it's, all they got to do is break about a second off of you. Okay? Will it, will it stop all of them? Absolutely not. Will it get 50%? Yeah. And I would say, let's just try it there. Let's see what happens. I mean, what are you out? There are portable ones. The only problem is those are in the ground. They're spiked in the ground, actually lagged into the ground, but they don't take a lot of weight. So if you got, now that all the construction, you might not have a problem, but uh, trucks coming in, uh, semis coming in and out of there, eventually they would, they would move those things around. So, yeah, that's what they are. Not a rubber, the actual. No, well, I guess they're made out of rubber. I mean, you can get, you can do whatever okay. you want. Okay, uh, and they do. They they also have portable ones that go across there. Just something to think about. Like I said, it's it's up to you. But I only envision it being at one, and let's just try it. And like I said, I can't. And you wouldn't be able to use them up at the front gates because those are pavers, and there are loop systems that are underneath of the pavers. And the loop systems, they got to get changed. So, therefore, you don't you don't want to be going over the top. Make sense? Thanks. Thanks. Thank you, Rick. Do we have a picture of what what these would look like? Because I, I, you know, some of them are concrete and they're like a big bump. Some of them are the rumble, the yeah. whatever. And then there's those plastic, bright yellow ones with the screws here's, in them. Here, here's what you got to remember. No, I need it. Okay. Thank you. The the wider they are, the less you can go. And you can go up, you can go all the way up to six inches. Like I said, go over to Publish and just drive over those. I guarantee you, and it slows you down, but it's not going to throw your coffee up over the front of you. Not unless you're doing way more than you should be. And what, where your white line is, that's probably where I would put the first one. And the other one would be pretty close to the arm itself. Depending on, like I said, there's multiple loop systems. There's two in front of there. Plus, there's a couple. There's one more safety in there. So, there you go. Well, uh, again, I think that uh, we ask the we, we appoint these committees. We ask these committees to give recommendations, and I just feel when we just ignore their recommendations, uh, they're the ones that have out there and done the work. Um, I'm not sure the seven of us are smarter than the people on the committees that, that are making these recommendations. And uh, I'll be with you in a minute, Daryl. And I just think that um, what's it going to hurt to try to Chafal to take their recommendation and try it? If it doesn't work, I'll be the first one to say it doesn't work. You're all right and I'm wrong. But I just don't understand why we're not willing as a board to give this a shot. Can somebody explain to me why we can't yeah. give it a shot? Why are talking exactly. one, just one speed, speed bump at the sure. oh. yeah. as a test? Yeah. As do, a we, test. do we know exactly how many gay strikes occurred in the past month on that Trafalgar exit? How many times? Uh, uh, last month, I personally did 13, was August, I personally did 13 very early repairs. That's just me. That ain't counting the maintenance man or the security. So do we have an exact number of how many times the Trafalgar exit gate bar it, it, was hit? It's up in the air. I understand. So then what are we, how are we measuring this against anything? How are we testing this against? We have to have figures. How a 30% right. reduction because against I what? I've sat out there for the last four months. Okay. I, I know exactly how many times these things get hit. I'm the guy that's been up. So now how many times have they hit? I, I've been giving to you every month. What I want to know is if we have data to compare whether this is effective or it's not. It's $813 for the arm. I understand that. Okay. We also installed I mean, cameras. Whatever you want to do. If you don't want to find I'm just asking questions. 
And I've been giving you answers for the last 90 days. And I still got questions. Okay. Well, <laughs> yeah. If you don't want it, fine. I'm just asking they, questions. They have provided data. Well, well, I'm, I'm just saying. Over the All right. If we have that number and then we put in speed bumps, we can compare it over the next month to see if there's been a reduction. I'm not confident that we have that number. I, I think we can go back and get that number based on what he's provided us in the past. I didn't get a clear answer on that. Yes. Now that Rick has talked about the uh, bump at Publix, that is less intrusive, it's less of a problem than the one that FSW uses. There's a big difference because the one at, uh, as I said, Publix, I have no problem with. The other one, I think, is a big uh, issue because of the height of the bump. But if everybody would like to hear presentations from companies, I, you know, I don't have a problem with that. You want me to clarify something that you thought? Because I did a lot of research. <laughs> they come in different sizes. And the size of the bump, I thought, was the same. It's the same size. 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 It's the same size
that it forced some sort of movement with a car. Yeah. I, re I recall some discussion. I wasn't on the board then, but I think that was the impetus. Okay, yeah. I knew there was a reason why they were taken down, that we had one at our street, and it did impede if you had a bicyclist and you had a car, then the car had to go around the bicycle, and then it was it was a, something that it was. I don't find that particularly persuasive. I think that's more reason to slow down that you have someone riding a bike and you're in a car. What but the reason was why it was why they were taken down because we did have them up at one time. I believe that's the reasoning. I just personally don't find it persuasive. And, and I don't think we need. We just need those on the thoroughfare mm -hmm. crosswalks, not. Yeah. I see. I can't tell you how many times I see cars. You know, a little girl walking across the street, and I see a car blow through it. There's not much that agitates me more in this community than that. One time it takes, and uh, so I would like we to. We will have an accident here one day because of speeders. Just as an FYI, uh, the city council brought up uh, traffic calming. Policy. They needed to have a policy before they instituted anything, and there could never. And with the eight council members, there was never agreement. So they still don't have a policy, and they still don't do it. Well, I'm I'm going to make a motion that we okay. beta test speed bumps at the Trafalgar Gate um, for. Uh, 60 days, see what, what results we get. Um, and if it, it does, in fact, eliminate gate strike, slow, slow the traffic down. Before you make a motion, you have to pass the gavel because the chair cannot make a motion. Hmm? I'm sorry, that's Robert's rules. Okay. Well, let me pass the gavel to you, young man. I get back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's going to hit me in the head. I've been waiting for yeah, yeah. Yeah. Knock, knock some sense in me now. Huh? Use against me. Okay. And I'm doing that because I nobody else nobody else is going to make that I'll motion. Make, so I'll make a motion to put it just at Trafalgar. Okay. And I'll second that motion. Well, specifics. It's the Trafalgar, the one Trafalgar exit gate. Right. One Trafalgar exit gate. Is this open for discussion? Open for discussion. Give me that back. <laughs> <laughs> I um, I would need confidence that we know the exact number of gate strikes. So if we do this test period, we're comparing it against objective data, not a feel. That is the one caveat I would have for this. Um, and again, this is for gate strikes. And I will note, it's my understanding we added cameras to the exit gates, which um, which should be able to allow us to find and have some impact also. And we're not clear on that. That is my reservation that I'm not confident we have the data to do an actual test. Any other discussion? It's one bump at one gate, or is it two bumps? Two, two, well, two bumps, bumps at one gate. Two humps yeah. at one gate. Yeah. Two humps at one gate. One at the white line and one closer, closer. to where the bar drops. Right, Rick? Bingo. Bingo. Providing, okay. providing they don't interfere with what's underneath the loops. Thank you, Rick. I just want to be sure what we're talking about about the bump because there's several shown right here. Some are semi permanent and some are movable. Are we talking about the movable? Yes. Yeah. So we'll be the first. Any other questions? Call for the question. All in favor? Trial? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sure. I don't care. Okay. We should, I mean, we should, put it, we should put it in there in the motion. Add that to the motion. 60 day time frame. Two speedos. Okay. 
Yeah. I'd have taken six minutes. Two speed. Two. Two. two speed bump. Right. Or you want me to make the motion again? Well, to restate the, the motion. Yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, we can. Oh, oh. <laughs> I'll, let, I'll let you and Rick fight uh, those committees. Fight that out. I make a motion to put two speed bumps at Trafalgar for a sixty-day period, trial period. Exit. At a cost of. What was the cost, Ed? Five hundred installed for one. Not to exceed two thousand dollars. Not to exceed two thousand dollars reasonable. That gives some fluctuation. No, I'm just saying that. Did you second this then? Yes. Make it before. Second it again. Okay, any more amendments? Yeah. <laughs> I'm almost sorry I brought it up. <laughs> uh, call for the question. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? <laughs> carries. Five. Motion carries. Um, Want to move on to the, uh, uh, the two other recommendations were the uh, Signs in the crosswalks on the major on the, uh, major thoroughfares um, crosswalks. I, I do agree. I think that's something that we should implement again. I think it will affect it. I'd entertain a motion to that. I'll make I'll make a motion. I'll make the uh, motion to accept the advisory committee recommendation to put yield signs in the center. Crosswalks as recommended. As recommended. On, the park, on the parkway and the boulevard. Correct. Okay. I'll second. I, I just have a question to ask about the stop signs themselves. Why are the stop signs after the crosswalk? Shouldn't they? Shouldn't they? <laughs> I, 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 I did talk to Kate Cole Police. We went through it. Here's the thing. Did you know what the cost of those signs were? They were uh, uh, <laughs> installed. We got them installed. Nobody wanted to install them. So 24 screws. It's like a maybe it should be able to do that. Six by six inch plate. They fell through them and things like that. Yeah. Well, maybe it should be able to install those. That's what I'm thinking. At least a few. It's pretty good, that drawing. Good. Do we know how many, uh, off the top of my head, I don't know, how many cross blocks yeah. we have in a boulevard? On the boulevard and the parkway, there's 16. 16? Give or take a few, because there's a couple that are in question. So you have the islands with the trees, right? The one foot sign at the island, or you leave those alone. It's like a finished figure. There's only three on the boulevard, I mean, on the parkway. There's only three there. And there's a, and the rest of them are on Trafalgar uh, and, and back to Veterans. So you're referring to the veterans? Entrance, if we put it on the front, so when you're entering a community, put 
put the yield sign on the front, it would still be effective for people that are entering. And you say they're a couple hundred bucks? There's 16 crosswalks? That doesn't make no sense. All together. Why don't we allocate the resources to do all crosswalks and we can confirm a number later? I wouldn't want okay. that to hold us up. Right. Mm -hmm. So we're talking about 35 million dollars, roughly. Sounds right. We want to add that to it. How much for the unit itself? say four hundred dollars per sign for the amount of crosswalks that we have. Yeah, um Gary yeah. can help you and the board. The report that we sent to all of you has total cost for doing it. Thank you. Um any more does installation for thirty crosswalks for a total of nine thousand one hundred and fifty. Second. Any more discussion? So we're going to allocate the six grand. Is it? How, much, how much are we going to allocate? Six grand. We're going to allocate uh, uh, per unit price. Oh, unit price. Okay. Per unit. So we'll see how it goes. Okay. Any questions? All in favor? Opposed? Motion carries. We're on a roll. Uh, <laughs> The third item was the uh, uh, yeah we talked about the uh, speed limit sign already. Right? We haven't voted on it. We haven't or, voted on that. Do we want to uh, have that person come in and do a demonstration first? I mean, I think it would be helpful to to hear more about it, um, especially if they're not movable. We'd probably want to figure out how many yeah. we need. I didn't realize. I, I guess I didn't realize. I think there are portable units as well, but I'm not. I'm not 100 percent sure yet. We'd have to. I know there's portable cameras. Yeah. For sure, there's portable cameras. Because because the only have lights to place in the rear in Florida, the, the cameras here, the, the cameras here, the mm -hmm. speeds here to catch the license plate. So can okay. we uh, make arrangements? Uh, the next meeting, to have a representative come in and make a presentation to the board. Can I ask you a question? Um, so it shows the license plate of somebody that has been speeding. Can we actually find them? Yes. 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 I just wasn't sure whether it had to be law enforcement. Nope. Nope. Okay. Uh, I think that was those were the uh, major things. And just to clarify something Ed said, because the question comes up, why can't we just have Cape Coral come in here and enforce uh, traffic? You know, I've met on several occasions with Chief Sizemore, and that's not an easy process. First of all, our, our roadways are not legal roadways as it relates to the Florida Department of Transportation. So they would have to come in and do a study and we'd have to bring everything up to snuff, which could cost tens of thousands of dollars. 
to bring everything up to stuff, then they're going to tell us what the speed limits are going to be. Uh, could be more, could be less. Uh, and then, as the chief said, we could come in and enforce them when we can get there. But they're not going to dedicate a police officer to just work uh, the streets of, uh, of Sandoval. So I'm not sure, it, it, you know, the investment probably is not worth what we gain in the end uh, to get that done. So it's not just something where we can pick up the phone and call them and ask them to do it. I know they, they'd love to. We have several policemen that live in our community. Um, going to have a few of them here tomorrow night. But um, just so the community's aware, that's not something that's uh, feasible at this point in time. Gary, can I add to <clears throat> One of the things that city council members were well aware of, which is why more and more gated communities are approved, are the fact that the city general budget does not have to cover repairs to streets or patrolling or any of those things that they do outside of the gates. However, they also, um, if they were to do it, what we just passed a while ago about the speed bumps would not be allowed according to the state's green book. There has to be five, a minimum of five, in order to put in a speed bump. So gated communities do have the option to do things that are different from what the city does. And that's what we just did. Okay, we'll move along. Uh, special projects, I wanted to, uh, to unfortunately announce tonight that our good friend uh, Jim Swigert has uh, resigned uh, as a special projects committee chair. He was the committee, uh, Jim, and I can't, I can't uh, tell you how sad I am. I respect you, uh, you know, your decision. Um, but uh, we're going to miss you, my friend, really. Uh, this guy, uh, it, 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 I wish I was in as good a shape now as, I, as he is at his age. And um, the um, watching you walk the lakes a couple months ago, it's just, you're an inspiration to all of us. And uh, you've done so much good for this community that I, I want to thank you for everything you've done. And, you know, our doors are always open for you and any suggestions you may have. Would you like to say a few words? Okay. Uh, we're going to move back to Invera. We've invited uh, representatives from. Uh, and Vera, if you guys would like to come up. I just want to get a little bit of clarification on, um, in working with Rick and his committee, um, what we've done is I've uh, tasked um, the Finance Committee to work hand in glove with the Envira Committee to come to uh, a resolution on how we want to move forward with the gates in the future. Um, Try to get this all fixed, move forward, streamline everything that we have with Invera. Do we have to go in a different direction? Whatever that direction may be, and nobody's got minds made up on anything right now. Um, but we need to know what is a uh, what's what's available to us. Um, and there's been a you answered, Tim. I'll ask you to go over some of the questions that, that we asked. The common questions, you know. Why don't we get service on weekends? Why does it take so long to get service? Because there's misunderstandings in the community, and not everything that's going on is in Vera's fault. We, we, we get that, and Rick gets that, and uh, I know that uh, the gate strikes uh, certainly uh, aren't coming down on cars. Our cars are going through the gates, so uh, we can't put that on a Vera much as we'd like to. Uh, but, uh, you know, so what, can you just give us a brief overview? Yeah, I'm actually going to um, – my name is Kim Batar. I'm the account manager for Sandoval. Um, <laughs> Kim Batar, I'm the account manager for Sandoval. Um, I did want to just touch base a little bit. I checked with our install department before the meeting with the gate strike sensors. You currently don't have gate strike sensors on any of your exit gates. So 
So the board did approve that, and those should be in in about a week to a week and a half um, with the cameras. So that will we'll be able to then then tell you, Ron, exactly what the, that gate strike number is on those gates. But Jordan Parsley is our service manager, and I'm going to have him pick up the slide about some of the questions we have for service related. So do you want me to go through the questions now? No. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. So the first question was service issues primarily delays and primarily delays in ordering the wrong parts, etc. Um, so with the wrong parts being ordered, this was not that we ordered the wrong part from the manufacturer. The manufacturer shipped us the box with the right part number with the wrong part in it. Um, so that was sitting on our warehouse shelf. Um, so when the board approved the repairs for the controller at the, uh, I believe it was the resident barrier gate at the veteran's entrance, we went to install it and it was the wrong Part. So we had to go back to our warehouse, get the part, come back and install the next day. So that's the story with that one. Um, um, now I respond in detail with, with everything um, to the board, but I don't know if that we should go over that here. But that's up to you. If you want me to go through line by line. Yeah, we can discuss it line by line. Okay. So what I, whatever it was, um, wrong parts being ordered. This is in reference to a work order for the resident barrier gate at the veteran's entrance. The original work order request was on the 31st. Tech completed the work order first thing in the morning on the ninth, on the first, excuse me, and a proposal was sent the same day. Um, this is an expensive part not covered under the community service and maintenance plan for the gates, and it needed to be approved before we would repair. These parts were ordered on the eighth, which was a Wednesday. From what I'm seeing, our technician schedules for the week of the eighth in the southwest region were already full with high priority service calls for other communities. Uh, we kept Casey the um, CAM updated with the schedule date, and this was completed on Monday the thirteenth. Um, unfortunately, the manufacturer sent us the incorrect part, but the product information on the box was correct. We were able to pick up the correct part from our warehouse and install the next day on 914. Just a quick question for mm -hmm. you on that. Is that okay? Yes. Um, are you aware when an entrance arm is not working? Is it here automatically at low? So we have gate strike protection. We don't have malfunction protection. How would you know that the veterans arm was not working. How is that communicated to you? That could be communicated through us by a resident through the kiosk. We would report it to the guard who then would send it over to our, we call our service support team. Um, otherwise, it'd be the, the board or the community association manager who would say, hey, whatever gate's stuck in the open position, can you send a tech out to investigate? We both agree that having a main entrance arm open to to allow complete access to the community for a month is an un unacceptable amount of time. Would you agree with that? It was, it was two weeks. Well, it's still a long time. Yes. Okay, well, and, that, and that's where I'm going with this. Um, you said you've got the work order on August 31st, but Correct. there were emails sent from me and from Gary on the 19th referencing that it would stop working on the 14th. So we're looking at August 14th as the date when that gate was wide open and our community was left open for a month. I'll have to, do you know where those emails were sent? They were in communication between us and uh, I believe FSR. Oh. Okay. So the first email I have was from the thirty first. Was on the thirty first, yes sir. Okay. So I can I can go back and check if there's anything prior to that, but that according to my my notes in our work order and our system it was the thirty first. So I okay. can look into that. Oh, well, I would hope that going forward we can establish a well, reporting protocol to make sure that there is that communication with you directly, immediately, so we can identify the problem early on. Because that was very uh, concerning for everybody. We have open access. We have all these residents waiting in line on other areas of the community to get in, but it's like a ship with a hole. <laughs> the rest of the boat has, uh, you know, is working fine, but uh, this particular hole is sinking the ship, and we have a crosswalk right there. And we had some serious uh, issues of people speeding right through there. Um, and it was for a month in, in total. So I will look into that. On my okay, for sure. thank you. Yep. Any other questions regarding number one? Nope. nope. Okay. Number two was excessive downtime um, or delays for repairs. Um, so I did run reports for the past 90 days and found our average time to repair was a total of five days. This is including the weekends and any community approvals required for gate repairs and or lightning damage. Also, please note, well, we are in what is considered our storm season, and our time to repair is, is extended during this time due to increased work order volume from the uh, afternoon thunderstorms. So 
So the months of typically May through August with the, the daily thunderstorms, obviously creates more work orders and it's harder to get out timely. How many technicians do you have that live in the immediate area? In the immediate area? Yeah, we, have, we have one technician that lives in the immediate one, area. One. Yes, sir. The service is all southwest? No, sir. So we have three total for southwest, but the closest one is in Cape Coral. Okay. So um, the rest are in the Sarasota area. But we do shift our resources south to help. Coverage. How big is that tech's area coverage? Um, so the one tech? Yeah. So three techs cover the whole southwest. So that's from Naples up to right about the Manatee County line. Okay. You said you had one of them in the heart. Yes. He, would be, he or she would be the primary technician. Correct. Member. Correct. How far do, would that person really go up the? No, he typically stays in the Naples, Fort Myers. He doesn't typically go north okay. of his home address. So he primarily stays up here. How many projects do you service? How many, how many communities? How many, how many communities do you service? Um, in, this area? in the southwest area? I have an exact number I can get you later, but I don't have it with me now. If I had to guess, we have. I. Around or more than 50 communities. 50? Five zero or five? Five zero. Yes. I said between 50 and 75. I'd have to look it up. Okay, we've got, here. we've got an actual report we have for that, so I can get that. So it's keeping that person pretty busy. Uh, yeah, like I said, it depends on the work order volume. I mean, if you've got storms, that's obviously going to increase that and um, cause the backlog. But um, for the rest of the year, typically, as long as there's no rain, Thunderstorms, it's it's pretty quiet. It also depends on the amount of gate strikes. Because gate strikes cause right. additional stuff like that. So, um, any other questions as far as excessive time to repair? Okay. Um, next one is service techs not prepared or equipped to make on spot repairs. Um, so, unfortunately, due to the comprehensive systems we service, access control, audio, virtual gate guard, barrier gates, and the difference between indoor and outdoor rated parts. So, for example, you've got indoor rated access control, outdoor rated access control, indoor cameras, outdoor cameras, stuff like that. We cannot carry every piece of equipment on our trucks. Um, we do carry most used parts on our trucks. Um, by use, most used, I mean we have a report, top parts used for all of Florida. We stock those on our trucks. Um, and even more parts in our warehouses. Um, even so, there are expensive parts which do not fail often. We do not carry on the trucks or store in our warehouse and need to be ordered directly from the manufacturer. Any questions? Okay. Um, this one, the next one's for, for you. Well, so next one is describe exactly what the current service agreement covers and what other options. What are other options? If you can get the current uh, service detailed to me prior to the meeting, it would be appreciated. Um, so we did provide it to the board. Um, quick run through. Essentially, our service maintenance plan covers. Um, all equipment installed by Invera, which would be the, the virtual gate guard, the access control, and the cameras at the entrances. Um, but we do not have a service and maintenance agreement on the barrier gates that we installed. And the barrier gates that we installed are the veterans entrance barrier arms, resident and visitor, and the Trafalgar resident and visitor barrier arms. Um, agreement on those? Yes. Okay. <laughs> so we can have a sort of maintenance agreement for the barrier arms, but I think that it was like eight fifty a month. But the, but the problem with that is then it does not cover gate strikes. So if it's struck by a vehicle, it's just a gate strike. So the service and maintenance doesn't include light and gate or repair. So that's the only thing that we can do. What, what would you absolutely not cover in, in, in any of our entrance or exits? As far as gates or? So the same thing. So regardless if the community has a service maintenance plan, we don't cover vandalism, riots, fires, acts of God, um, flooding, whatever. So if, and for instance, the lightning, lightning actually struck very near, lightning struck very near to the clubhouses here, took out some cameras, access control equipment, stuff like that. So that w will not be covered no matter, not through Invera. Metal gates, everything. Oh, that's, where, that's where I was going. Yeah. The yeah. metal gates are not embarrassed. <laughs> no, and we will not. We won't service we the metal gates. No, sir. Retrofit and then put 
put that under the maintenance umbrella for the gates? The swing gates? The metal swing gates? Yes. No, we do not service metal swing gates at all. It, that carries a different license, from what I understand. And we don't service them. We're not, we don't have hard stock for those. We don't have experience. It's welding. We don't get into that. Okay. Um, next is um, the community wanted to quote for the new technology of um, QR code or scan entry at the kiosk, which I believe Kim has a quote for that. This is a friend in the community, and they sent me a scan on my phone, and I just went up yeah. and put the phone up and let me in. It's so pretty we, cool. We normally do that. Your automation rate as a community is really good. It's about 60%. Usually the QR codes are scanners from the gates or from people who don't have any kind of automation, and they utilize the QR code. So at that point, with that, the normal is like 15 to 20%. has a very high success rate. We can add a QR code scanner to your existing kiosk. I can send them a You send them through the Mayan Vera app. You would send them the code and then it would... That's how they get in, correct. right? Mm -hmm. It doesn't need to call me anymore in Vera. No. They just, they're automatically left correct. in. You either email it or um, provide right. it via text message. Yeah. Success rate of that pretty good? What is, the, when you're saying automation, is that the license plate readers? The license, um, driver's license scanner with the camera. It doesn't sound like that would be a huge benefit for us right now, it's, from what I'm hearing. We do have a lot of, we have a lot of homeowners here. I don't know if it's going to be smartphones everywhere. As long no. as the people are comfortable doing that and will utilize it, then it's just rather than taking your driver's license, Now, like when we provide access through Invero, we can say it's you know the time for a certain day. It mm -hmm. expires after that window for the for the QR for codes. QR, so we have anti pass back, so kids can't have parties or like get shot in and send it to 100 people. Okay. So yeah. you can put parameters on that where it can only be used once an hour. Or, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. I'm trying to. Um, so we can we can do uh, controls on that. Request the controls to be put in place? Yes, mm -hmm. the board so, would have to. Okay, so if there are no controls in place, could there ever be a pass issued that can be used multiple times without? Yeah, I have a community that if they have, if a homeowner has a lot of people coming through, the easiest way to get them through quickly is to use the QR codes. And with board permission, then they are able to send that to multiple people with the same code, rather than creating 50 codes for different people. So there's there's different parameters, but it is up, up to the board's discretion. But you said there is an anti pass back, so you said yes. Kids can't have a party and just keep passing right. the phone back and right. forth. Right, we have to meet, but you have to, the board has to tell us they want that. Not it doesn't automatically come like that. I'm sure, it comes at additional cost as well. Yeah. Right? I don't know. No. <laughs> no. no. <laughs> Good. Good news. Right. <laughs> Any other questions regarding QR? Um, um, so the next next item was no service at all over the weekend. So Invera does perform emergency service outside of normal business hours. Um, and I, I said, please see the community gate break and gate malfunction instructions below. Um, if the community does not request a tech to be dispatched after hours, we will not automatically dispatch. There are billable service calls. Or, I'm sorry, these are billable service calls at premium rates. Um, please let me know if you would like to make any changes to the instructions below, which, and I provide on the email, the current instructions. So we do have emergency after-hour service. Um, we will not do it automatically. It has to be requested by the community because they are billable service calls, regardless if it's covered under the service maintenance plan or not. So 
for instance, if you have a, a reader that's not working, regardless if it's a malfunction of the reader or a lightning strike, and we come out after hours, it's billable. Now, the part would be covered under service maintenance plan, but the time for the technical amount after hours would be billable. You can provide us, or you have? I can provide you our, our rates during normal, as, during, during normal hours, like, after hours, holiday hours, yes. I can like provide to that. Take a look at, look at that at least. When it hits the fan, it's usually on a weekend. Right. Uh, and then Friday afternoon. Friday at 4 o'clock. That's right. right. And then we're down for Correct. two days and everybody's at arms. Right. Um, and that, like Jordan said, that could be changed. We just go based on what those gate break matrix tell us. We have communities that we send the incident report and then we automatically dispatch if it's our barrier arms. Um, if you have a maintenance person, you know, if they're willing to do that on the weekend or other <coughs> volunteers. <laughs> Um, it just saves the community the, the money. But we just didn't want you to think that we don't have service available on the weekend if we did the weekend. Yeah. Uh, last few months. It's kind of wearing thin. <laughs> is that that is it for the list I have on, my, on that email. Um, from the boards, any other? I just have a couple quick ones questions real quickly. Uh, it was my understanding in the past there were some real issues with the installation of the stickers, the location, and they weren't being installed properly. Has that been addressed? Um, we've been out, I was out uh, almost two years ago in February, and we did a, a uh, I wouldn't call it a class, just people came up and met us at the gate, and then Jordan was out um, probably four months ago, five months ago, and did another one. I have not heard recently of any issues. Um, if, they've, if they've been, if they haven't come to me, they could have gone directly to customer service. But are you aware whether or not any staff or volunteers installing stickers currently have been trained? Or is that something that you just wouldn't know? Um, well, after Jordan was out here, a detailed email was sent with the instructions on, gate, on placement. Uh, your placement is a little bit different than most of the communities, and they're aware of that. Okay. Um, do, you routine, do you routinely check in with the staff to, to reach out to them to see if they need any I have, um, Casey and I communicate quite often um, it, between her and other our whole departments. Um, I did print, we do have a new, and I didn't realize she was out, we do have a new phone number and email address that's for CAMs and board members, because I do know that there's times where you really need to get through to somebody, and it can be confusing, I was on that side, so I, I get it. Um, so I have that sheet that I wrote down the new customer service number. Um, so I'd like to share that with the board, and then I can give it to, to Steve um, as well. Okay. My last question is, um, how often do you test the readers to make sure they're working at full capacity, not just working, but working properly? So, like position to do the reads. Right. right. So we don't typically do a preventative maintenance type deal. Um, with most communities, we're out and <coughs> are working on or at the gates and can see if there's an issue. Um, so again, it's a heavily relied on by the community or the, the community association to tell us, hey, there's issues at so-and-so gate, um, but we don't typically routinely check. Is that um, something that's a service that's provided as part of our contract? So if that's a requested? That is something we're looking into with our system as far as generating automated service calls. Otherwise, it'd be um, a manual process for somebody to remember, hey, it's, it's been 90 days, we should go check Sandoval. So we can try at our best ability. I, guess I can just put it that so way. I can say the resident gate at Trafalgar has always been an issue. It's the only gate I've had to pull up multiple times, back up, pull up, and right. I'm confident it's not working at 100% okay. capacity because the other gates don't do that. Okay. Thank you for your time. So I, I'll that. write that down, and I can have a tech out to to monitor traffic at the resident Trafalgar gate. Appreciate it. Uh, one last question: the the uh, card reader at uh, uh, coming in on the Pine Island uh, residence entrance has been doing a mean lean for uh, a long time. That's not that's not part of your agreement. The post. The, the post, yeah, it's bent forward. Which which post? I'm sorry. When you come in on Pine Island in the residence entrance. The oh, the car. okay for the. For people to use their. Yeah. There's a card reader on. 
I got gotcha. you. Oh, for so the, the little fog. Right, yeah, okay. Right. So that one's leaning? Yeah, yeah. Okay, it's so it's been, hit, it's been hit by something or yeah. just come loose over time? Okay. Um, it needs to be repaired. Okay. All right. And that was at Pine Island. Pine Island. Right, Pine Island. Okay. And I mean, obviously, gates malfunction. Do, uh, do you have any idea on what an acceptable level is? Like, what a percentage is of malfunctions that you'd say is within reason? So your your kiosk, your visitor fees run between like sixteen thousand and twenty thousand just on the visitor side. Right. A conservative estimate for the resident side is three times that number. So your gates are running like. It was just a small sample of time, maybe maybe a month, but it came back that it was between 27 and 28 percent was determined to be gate malfunctions. And I didn't know if that was was that the report that it, it was from our yeah. yeah yeah it was basically yeah, it was, like how many gate hits. Well, okay. So to put everything in perspective, so as you said, you're talking 45 thousand a month. Um, last 90 days, I pulled our work order history. We've only been out here 30 something times. So even if it's one gate 30 times over 130-something thousand cycles, it's very much worth it. Any other questions? Any other anything to add, ask? Yeah, I, I think what you need to do is explain to them what's not covered so that they see. And remember, they only have two gates, entrance, outer, I am sure everybody in Weaver, at least my impression from the day one when, they, when we were sold the system, that it's all in Vera and don't worry about it. I would agree, everybody would think. Yep. I can assure you that for the last 120 days, Right, so, um, so Invera installed the resident barrier gate and the visitor barrier gate at both the Surfside and Trafalgar entrances. The swing gates, um, all swing gates, and the exit barrier arms at the Surfside and Trafalgar, Invera does not maintain or service, and all the gates at Pine Island are not Invera's. We do not install them, we don't service them. So that is a different vendor. Um, currently, I don't know who that is. We would not do swing gates. We don't. We do not. We have not done swing gates ever. You can't do the swing? No, it requires welding. I'm, I'm pretty sure it requires a, a different license that we are not for. We don't have that license to install. So, do you have any type of uh, uh, re re relationship with with another company that does that type of work that you have yes. strategic alliance with? Yes. Um, one specifically is Gate Pros. So they cover from Tampa down to Naples, and we have a very good working relationship with them. I don't know the rates. I don't know if they have preventative maintenance. That I don't know, but I do know we have a good relationship with them. What's their name? Gate Pros. Gate Dash Pros. Um, and the owner's name is Chad Knight. Okay. Board, any other questions from the board? Thank you very much for attending. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate yeah, very it. helpful. We appreciate it. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Uh, any. Comments on the street paving uh, issue. I understand they were were they out here yesterday or today, uh, day before the street paving company. Today. Okay. 
we have any idea when a project's going to get finished up or race oh. told? Okay. Okay. Um, moving along, that as as you know, um, past couple of weeks the board went into executive session, and uh, if you don't understand the ramifications of executive session, the the exec the board can go in for two reasons in ex executive sessions. It's to discuss personnel issues uh, or discuss legal issues, and our attorney is always with us in those executive sessions to maintain client attorney privilege. Uh, there's uh, no uh, secret sauce being sold at these meetings uh, or uh, uh, you know, underhand things going like uh, some of the comments we're hearing. Uh, it's purely to make a decision on one of those two um, uh, reasons. Um, this. As a result of our past meetings, um, we announced tonight that we have uh, exercised our right uh, to a 90-day no-fault termination with uh, First Services Residential. Um, we thank them for uh, everything they've offered uh, offered us so far this year, but the board's decided to move in a different direction, and uh, they're going to work. Steve has pledged to have a, a transition through uh, the end of this year, so... Uh, uh, that was the reason for those meetings, and now you know. And under solicitation for additional agenda items, I uh, just want to use this time to announce that um, uh, we've we've uh, uh, I want to make a uh, entertain a motion to announce uh, nominate Dave Saganic onto the uh, finance committee. I'll move that. Yep, yep. John, I know you're 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 good with that. So, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Okay. Yep. Well, congratulations, Melly. <laughs> what am I appointed to? <laughs> 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 you can't leave the room. Yeah. Dave Sagan. Um, oh, yeah. Okay. Can now I'll make a motion to adjourn to open form? No, wait, no, no, wait, no, 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 I can. I have an solicitation. Oh, I'm sorry. We need board action on the committee for gates. We need authority to go for pricing. Um, we've been we've been prevented from going. For, our gate committee has been prevented from going for pricing by management, and so they they want board approval so that this committee can go out and get a solution. And bring you. Who's requiring board approval? What? Who, who's requiring board approval? Our manager has said only that she only she can get pricing from vendors, and our committee cannot. So okay. we need the committee to be able to develop RFPs and come back to you with a with a, the pros and cons of various vendors, what the cost will be, and try to get a total solution to wrap this together. And you're, That's, you're just asking for quotes, right? Pardon? Right. The ability to go out and get quotes? Yes, but you need to name the people, and the people that Gary was hoping would be on there would be certainly the three members of the committee would be uh, Rick, of course, Aaron, Todd Reinhardt, and then add me to help from finance. Mm -hmm. Right. If, if you look, if I would, would appreciate your, uh, your approval to, get, to let us do that. I'm, I'm not. Steve, I'm not sure uh, I understand a downside to letting a committee uh, solicit quotes. I don't think there is a downside. See a downside? I don't think there is a downside. Just, just as long as the committee's in line with what the expectation is. Okay. They're, they're you know, going through a formal RFP process so everybody's putting apples to apples. Absolutely. You know, that type of thing. Sure. And I think that's our understanding to make it uh, a, a, a uniform process for everyone so we can evaluate properly. I know Erin was so disgruntled by the fact she couldn't do that that she only wants to work on this if you give us the authority. Well, I think that uh, is, I don't see a downside, frankly. Um, and I guess the caveat would be to make it a formal RFP process so the quotes we can evaluate apples to apples. Yes. So I would move to allow the uh, committee to solicit quotes in a formal RFP process for, for the gates. 
motion? Motion's I'll open. Second by Mary. Any discussion? Open question. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Oh, she carries. Thank you, John. I'm sorry. Kathy, go. Um, yes. Didn't mean um, to bypass you. Yeah, I'd like to make a motion to add to the agenda the um, levy of fines, gate strikes, and um, deep compliance. Someone would second? I second. Okay. All right. So the Covenants um, Committee met on September 16th, and um, there are 15 um, accounts that recommendations were made to fine. Um, the, some of the fines were for um, trash, mulch, weeds, um, grass and pavers, tree needing trimming, <coughs> as well as parking on the grass, parking on the street overnight, and gate strikes. So um, for account number 0604, um, the recommendation was to fine for five violations, $100 each for a total of $500. If um, some... I make the motion to fine if somebody. And that's just for um, one residence. Violations on the residence. No, because the, the reason I'm asking is I want to make sure I understand, uh, and it is something I'm going to bring up. Um, any fines associated with behavior, I want to be clear, we discuss. So if there are yes. any fines that have to do with an individual's behavior towards staff or volunteers, Please raise that to my awareness before I vote. Okay. Okay. Yes. Thank indeed. you. Okay. So for this specific account, the vi the five violations were for trash, mulch, weeds, grass and pavers, and trees needing trimming. And in the allotted time, that the cure was not made. The, the recommendation of the committee was to fine um, hundred dollars each, a total of five hundred dollars. So, all right, Melanie seconds. Uh, uh, Gary, do you want to call or want me to? So all in favor? Yeah. All right, so the, that motion uh, carries. All right, the next one was a, um, a split by the, the committee. In this instance, it was account 0897. The committee made a motion to fine as well as a motion to not fine. There were three violations cited, speeding, reckless driving, and code of conduct and nuisance. In this instance, my understanding was um, a vehicle was observed, and there were multiple complaints that was reckless driving, came in the wrong gate, um, uh, blew through stop signs, gave the finger to residents, and I believe a board member. Um, so the um, in this instance, with the split 2-2 two -two of the committee split, it would be accelerated now to the board as to whether the recommendation is defined or not. And it's the actual, oh, sorry. Can we have more detail on this I don't have the, that was during the executive, yeah. so I didn't hear all of it other than I spoke briefly with um, Aaron today on this one. The code of conduct was the, you know, yeah. he, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> he gave the finger, sorry. I didn't mean to do that. <laughs> yeah. Any factual questions? Uh, I was the board member who got the burr, so. <laughs> As well as, you know, he was swearing and cussing at people that was and telling him to was slow car, down. And they were doing about 80 miles. An and there was, hour a girl, on there was a girl on a bike in a crosswalk. And True. it was, you know, reckless. So the nuisance. Hanging out the window, screaming. It was a very dangerous situation. And I've got a recording on my phone, too. Okay. You want to recuse yourself from this vote? No. <laughs> <laughs> so well, that's pretty serious stuff. I, it I, is. Yeah, this I, one I, was. This one around. was. So again, it would be three violations, a hundred dollars each. Yeah. So was there was there a reason why it was split? Yeah. Um, I think because the code of conduct, the specific um, uh, incident report was lacking the information. You know, the who, what, when, where, why. And okay. I went over that with Aaron, you know, the log book, the incident report. Okay. Um, I think it was pre his time though too. So you know, the continuity. Mm -hmm. So in this look, case, look, looking for a motion. Looking for a motion. Fine yeah. or not fine? Yeah. Motion fine. fine by Lori. Second. Second by Anita. Any other okay. comments? All in favor? Aye. Aye. 
All right, so the motion carries. Thank you. All right, the next one, pretty simple. 0814 is the account number. The recommendation was defined for three violations, bulk trash, parking on the street, and the garage constantly open. Um, in this case, it would be a $1,000 fine for the garage door because it's reoccurring. Apparently, there's a boat on a trailer. The garage doesn't close. So it's not an isolated oh. incident. Okay, and it's annoying. There's been multiple complaints. $100 fine for parking on the street and the $100 fine for bulk trash that was left for weeks on end. Is there a motion? Motion. I even have a question. <laughs> Are the, it seems $1,000 seems like a large fine. Is that the standard for a second yeah, violation is $1,000? It's like per day. $100 for the first fine? So it's $100, and each day $100 up to the up maximum to. statutory amount of $1,000 per violation. Oh, okay. Do, right. so this do you know if this is one violation? Could it be open garage and also visible boat? Because, frankly, these neighbors are still going to continue to deal with this. If you I think it's been moved in the meantime. It has been, okay. Yeah. I'm not... So in this case, it was reoccurring. It wasn't cured in the allotted time, and after 10 days, it was you know, um, raised to the $1,000 fine. So in this case, it would be a um, $1,200 fine in total for the three violations. Is there a motion? And this and the resident knows this. Oh, right, yes. Letters, no. certified he's, letters. He's, okay. okay. Get the opportunity to come if to the they, covenant. If they the receive the notification. And, yeah. Okay. For, the, for the garage being open, and this is a special instance, especially if it can't close because of the boat, but is that something that we need to maybe consider, like a broad communication reminding people about? Well, the garage is in the, um, it's provided for just to be open for, you know. In, in, in right, the, yeah, but there's a lot, I mean, there's a lot of people that have that open. I just didn't know if it was. Right. Erin is working on, um, you know, um, a publication, a simple general reminder that since he joined us on August 14th now, um, it hasn't quite been 60 days, but he's going to come out saying that these are some of the um, common oh, reoccurring thanks. concerns and as a general reminder, you Perfect. know, trash mm -hmm. cans, blah, 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 garage doors. Okay. Yeah, Great. he's working on that. We talked about that at the last covenants meeting. And this, it was recommended? Yes. Okay. The recommendation by the committee for these cases. So a motion? Motion. Mm -hmm. Melanie? Motion for that. Second? Lori? Favor. Favor. All, yeah, all in favor? Okay, motion carries. Thank you. All right, the next 0171, this was um, two violations. Um, speeding, reckless driving again, and a, um, a garage open. $100 fine for each. Motion. I'll make a motion. All right, Melanie. No, in second. Ron. Ron. All in favor? All in favor. Okay. Okay, motion okay. carries. Thank you. All right, uh, 0738, three violations, reckless driving, code of conduct, and nuisance. $100 fine for each. This one I don't have the particulars for. What is a nuisance? How is that defined? Do we know? Um, just the loud noise, music. It could be a host of issues. That's a nuisance? But it's part, it falls under that category. But it was recommended. It was recommended by the board, yes. Or the, by the committee. Okay. Sorry, excuse me. I make a motion. Okay, Ron. Second. Lori, thank you. All in favor? All in favor? Okay, motion carries. All right, the next, this is an interest, this interesting one, 0, 0807. The committee um, is looking, the recommendation is to fine for one trash violation. In this case, there were complaints that he was taking his horticulture um, and dumping it on the common area at the bend of the street. So he wasn't leaving it at his curb and leaving it for days. He was dumping it in the common area that's serviced by Crawford. Um, and there were, you know, neighbor complaints. 
So in this case, they're looking for a $100 fine for this instance against this homeowner. Motion. All right. Second. Second. I'll second. I can second, right? All in favor? Okay. Motion Good. carries. All right. This next one, 0149, this is a fine for parking on the street, a repeat offender. Um, the, recommend the full fine of $1,000. Lori. Should be more. I was going to say, yeah. Lori, a second? A second. Melanie, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, yeah, yeah. very good. Motion carries. All right, 0627. This was the vote to fine for not retaining the garage door. Apparently, a panel was replaced on the garage door, and it's an off color and it hasn't been painted. Um, it's been re inspected, still has not been resolved, so a $100 fine was recommended. I'll make the motion. Ron, thank you. Second? I'll second. Okay, Marilyn, thank you. All in favor? Aye. Thank you. Motion carries. All right, next, 0180. This was parking on the grass, a $100 fine. I'll make a motion. Melanie, yes. Yeah. Second. Ron? All in favor? Aye. Okay, motion carries. 1033, this was um, a recommendation to find for removal of plants without ARC approval. Um, a $100 fine for this. Are they the same plants? I don't have, on this one, I don't, I don't have I guess this. I'm questioning if you, was he putting in the same plants? Or was he putting in? For a reason? I mean, isn't that allowed that you don't have to go through ARC if you're replacing the same plant? I mean, I don't know what the circumstances. Yeah. Um, it was removal of plants. This, um, I wasn't, this is when I was at the executive session. I remember I was here and I ran late. So I wasn't there for the discussion. Um, but they all agreed. But they, the, the recommendation is to find, yeah. Okay. So they had pictures and they had um, the particulars. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, there were many, many cases, and some of them, you know, were awash because they were cured or, you know, they, they chopped it through. But in this case, the recommendation was to um, fine. I'll make the motion. Okay, Ron, thank you. I'll second. Melanie, thank you. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, motion carries. All right, just a couple more. 0672, this was parking on the street overnight, $100 fine. Motion. Melanie. Second. Ron. All in favor? Aye. Okay. Next, 0394, another one parking on the street overnight, $100 fine. Motion. Second. All right. And another one voted um, 0733, parking on the street overnight, $100 fine. Okay, Melanie. Second. Ron, thank you. All in favor? Aye. Okay, the motion carries on the three of those. All right, and the last two are for gate strikes. 1103, vote to fine for gate strike, $100 fine. In 1409, um, account 1409, vote, voted to fine for gate strike, $100 fine. Okay, on both, right, Lloyd? Okay. okay, second? Second. Ron? Okay. All in favor? Aye. Okay, motion carries. So, so they're all passed. Thank you. Um, I just want to add one clarification before we adjourn. Um, previously, um, the board made a resolution regarding um, the ability to find residents, and that resolution stated that you can find residents for swearing or threatening a, a staff member or committee volunteer. Uh, it, came to my attention that there have been some um, fines for behaviors that were outside of that. Maybe a joke or maybe um, raising your voice. Um, and what we want to do was take the subjective element out of it. So I want to reiterate that the ability to find a resident for unquote unquote behavior was limited to um, swearing and threatening a staff member or committee volunteer. Um, 
Does the board have any position to change that? Okay. Um, the only other the only other item that I wanted to mention was that we still have been kicking the can down the road, waiting to get these um, these bids regarding the automatic doors on the bathroom and the front of the uh, the building. Um, I think it's fair to provide a status update on that. Um, I know that we've got a, a couple different bids. One one bid was sent to us regarding um, the the bathrooms and the front door of the existing building. That bid did not provide access to the front door of this building. I requested a bid to include the front door. It made sense to me to not only include the two bathrooms in that building, the front door, but also the front door to this building. And we're currently waiting on that bid to be updated. So that's where that stands. Um, that's all that I have. Accept the motion to adjourn. I make the motion. I make the motion to adjourn. I'm sorry? I make the motion to adjourn. Oh, okay. Nita's made the motion. Second. Already second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Steve, is there any open quorum? Yes. My name is Ed Casey. I live on Castlebury Court. I'm there for a little bit more than three years. I have down to earth doing my lawn. I've got pictures here of how they're destroying the lawn and have destroyed the lawn on mine and my neighbors. They've eaten up the grass. They do this power shooting around. The lawn mowers are way too heavy because of when the ground is wet. But meanwhile, they're doing these spins. And I can show you pictures, if you care to see them, of what's going on. I've spent it to the office many times. I've had Mike from down to earth, which is no longer here. Now you have this lady, Sonia. She also was there. Nothing has been done to try to survey the problem. Between my property and the neighbor's property, they even destroyed a whole bunch of grass because they used that for a go-through with these big cannons going through. So I'm just a little bit on the noise size, as you can tell by my voice, and I just don't know what can be done. Okay, at 11 o'clock, if you could provide me those pictures and your address, please. I gave pictures into the office. I have not received them, but I can tell you that I'll physically be present. And Michael, Michael came over before. He, he's no longer there now. And I've got this Sonia there. She was there. She walked over, and they, she saw the thing in my, my property and the next-door neighbor's property. Well, well, which, I've just been... Which happens to be Maryland. <laughs> well, I've but the just thing, been, that's not the point that I'm here. The point is that it's just that it's upsetting me. I love the community. I love the quietness. I love the people and all this other stuff. But I can't get this down to earth. Now you've got, uh, what's it, Crawford? Across the street, they do such a beautiful job in everybody's property over there. But these guys are shooting up and down the place like animals. Well, and destroying the property. Well, I'm meeting the uh, in the entire landscaping committee is meeting Monday at 11 o'clock, and we re we have requested down the earth to be there at 11:30. I can go over this particular case with them, and then we can. Well, as I said, I gave Mike. He had these pictures. I can give them back to you tonight. I'll just screenshot them with my phone. There's four of them there. I'm sorry for being so No, no, I'd be frustrated. I would, I'm very careful in my yard, and this would bug the hell out of me, frankly. What is your, what is your address, sir? 2617, Castle Barry. This will be discussed. I give you my word. Okay. Thank you, Ed. Thank you. We did something right. <laughs> <laughs> Rob Parcell. My question is, I have a question for the board. Not knowing who's responsible, although I was informed by Craig Snyder. I'm amenities committee, and we've done all this work on the pickleball courts. And one of the main problems with the reason the, the uh, tennis courts um, needed to be repaired was from root intrusion. Well, part of the contract was supposed to be a root barrier placed in the between the 
bushes and trees and the, and the court. It's not been done. And uh, on top of that, I walked over to the courts the other day to see whether the nets were in. Of course, the nets are not in. They're on a boat in some port somewhere. But Crawford is replanting all the plants that they took out. They're going to have to tear them all up to get it done. And I, from what, and I talked with Craig Snyder, who was part of the committee that put this whole thing together, and he said it was supposed to be the um, landscape committee was supposed to be taking care of it because they, they didn't want more sports to do it. They were going to have Crawford do it. Well, it hasn't been done, and if it's not done, it's just going to tear up your courts again. Are you saying that Crawford is responsible for, for doing the root barrier? That's what my initial response was, and, and I, that's why I, call, I t texted Craig, and he says, yeah, it was landscape committee was supposed to take care of it. Landscaping meeting Monday, so, yeah, I, but so I will. Uh, I don't know. You know, it's. I been, will raise it and uh, get a clear answer on that. And you know, if they're not thing, going this to whole thing, six or eight months old. So it's by the time it started, the board's changed and people sure. have changed. And but I just don't want it to get lost in, nope. in the thing because it, it really needs to be done all the way around all the courts. So. Well, we'll follow up with you on that issue. It'll be raised directly to them, and if they do not uh, accept responsibility, we'll find a company that does. I mean, so. more sport will do it. I mean, they have a sub that comes in okay. and does it. That's was part of it. Wasn't the part of their quote. We, they just piecemealed it out to save money. Well, they, yeah, they piecemealed it out to save money. Okay. They didn't do it on the original well, quote. Thanks for bringing it to our attention. More sport did it, so yeah. I just want the thing to get I done was, and I done right. Aware. So. Thank, Thank you. you. Edward Coronado. Oh, he was. Um, he was the <laughs> Rick Collins. Rick Devine. Now you want to listen to this. <laughs> wow, this is a first. Show me who wants to find for cursing. <laughs> <laughs> we Five don't, seconds are up. We don't have to. We just can't. I probably only won like a thousand dollars after the Smoothies phone call. Yeah. It's not mandatory. I just made a, I want to suggest that you do a further study to the uh, law enforcement and safety administrations regarding speed bumps because there's nothing that's going to prevent somebody from hitting a child at a stop sign more than a speed bump. If you roll through a, a stop sign at 10 miles an hour, your cameras are not going to do anything. But at 10 miles an hour, if you hit a child, you know what's going to happen. So I, I definitely think speed bumps at certain areas are very, very relevant. Um, when you come down Sandoval Parkway and you come to Clairefont, where I live, I, wouldn't, I wish I had a penny for every car that goes through there. And it doesn't have to be at 30 miles an hour. But at 10 miles an hour, you're going to hit a baby in a carriage, you're going to hit a child, you're going to hit a dog, you're going to hit any, you know, anything. Anything can happen, and that's why I'm, I'm emphasizing certain places, speed bumps are relevant. It's the only thing that's going to work. That's all I have to say. I am a beer. <laughs> Persuasive. like to comment on uh, contracts and make a suggestion to the board that all contracts in the future be reviewed by the board and then not only signed by the GM but signed by the board president because we're in this halfway through a five-year contract with down to earth that has no accountability to them and how did we get in there? And when I look at that contract, the only one that signed it was Sean, nobody else. And that should never be, because we all have to live with them. So that's my recommendation. Good Thank you. Who are you on the list? I didn't write my name down, no. Three minutes. <laughs> get 
Oh, do you get something on the agenda? The board develops the agenda. Uh, the board president and the general manager put together the agenda. And do they get approached separately or at the meeting? I'm not sure I'm following you. Well, last month I gave a couple things, which is why I'm on camp three minutes. And I'll never hear from You can, you can do your three-minute speeches, and there's no guarantee it's going to get on the agenda. I can tell you some yep. things that are, I get emails, I get resident concerns, and they're escalated to a... Or through the committee. Um, or, or committees. Committee. Yeah, committee. So you can email board members, you can email um, management, you know, explain how significant of, a, of an issue it is. And uh, if it raises to that level, it could be presented to the, to the board. But um, you'd be amazed how many opinions there are out there. And if we conveyed every single opinion, we would not be leaving this room for a week. So I, I guess, and, and I'm not trying to be disingenuous in my response, but that's just how I develop it personally for me. Can you tell me when the, either the, board or the park committee suddenly made stones or rocks okay for mulch? Yeah, that was done. That was January, January 7th meeting. Scott DeFilippis and Don Wells mm -hmm. and um, the three of us, Bill, you were there, I think. Um, yep. The board voted that we allowed it not to, not to exceed more than, I think it was 30% or 50% of the front lawn. So the rocks, I put them in my house. Yes. They have to meet the specifics. They have to be a certain size. They have to be a certain color. They can't be white. Doesn't matter that they're butt ugly or anything, right? <laughs> <laughs> you, have to go through the, um, you have to go through the ARC committee. So they'll approve and make sure it meets the specs that were outlined in the January 7th board meeting. Okay. And you were talking about speed bumps, and I know everybody's got a, an opinion. I can remember young person speed bump. People race from speed bump to speed bump. Yeah. yeah. Just keep that in mind. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you everybody for attending and hope to see you tomorrow night.